Well, it is great to be with you, and let me jump in and get started. One of the things I love about the Bible is that God did not have a makeup artist out when he had the writers pen the stories of the Bible. He gave us uh, human stories with the blemishes still on. He gave us reality so that you and I could find encouragement and hope as we read the Scriptures. You see, the Bible is full of imperfect people. Think about it for a moment. Noah was a drunk. Abraham was old and a liar. Sarah laughed when God made promises. Isaac was a daydreamer. Jacob was a liar. Joseph was abused. Moses had a a, a stuttering problem and a very short fuse. Miriam was a gossip. Gideon was scared. Samson was a womanizer. Jeremiah and Timothy were really young for what God asked them to do. David started off really young by slaying a giant even when an armor didn't fit. Then he had an affair and organized a murder. Solomon was rich. That's not that that's a bad thing. He just was rich. Uh, (laughs) Elijah was burned out and suicidal. Isaiah preached naked. Aren't you glad the preachers around New Hope don't do that? (laughs) Y'all probably would never show up again. Jeremiah was depressed. Jonah ran from God because of extreme prejudice. Amos' only training to be a prophet was the school of the fig tree pruning. Um, John the Baptist ate bugs. Martha worried about everything. The Samaritan woman really liked men. Peter denied Jesus. The disciples fell asleep while praying. Thomas doubted. Zacchaeus was a tax cheat and a short guy. Paul himself was way too religious. Plus, he became a murderer, just like Moses and David. And of course, God still found a way to use Lazarus after he was dead. Doesn't that give us hope that God can still use us? Isn't it great to know that perfection is not a prerequisite for God to work in us and through us, not only for our good, but for the betterment of those who are around us. And this morning, as we launch a new series on the book of Jonah, if you want to find Jonah, it's tucked away in the Minor Prophets. It's called the Minor Prophet because there's a section of books before it called the Major Prophets. Just because the major prophets are called major and come first doesn't mean they're more important. The only reason for the title major and minor is the size of the book, all right? The major prophets are a lot more verses. The minor prophets are much smaller. I think there's only 48 verses in the entire four chapters uh, of the book of Jonah. You will find the book of Jonah tucked away on the bookshelf between Obadiah and Micah. Is that helping any of you all find, find that? Uh, okay, find Malachi, last book of the Old Testament, and go back eight books, all right? And you will find the little book of Jonah. It's probably two pages in your Bible. You see, Jonah is one of the most encouraging books of the Bible for me because of its multifaceted dimensions of God's grace, maybe like no other book in the Bible. We discover here God's grace for a city of despicable people, and we see His grace also for a stubborn, prejudiced, individual, reluctant preacher. There was a pastor who one Sunday morning was doing what they used to do. About 50 years ago, it was common practice that uh, one Sunday out of the month, the pastor would have the children's church come in to the sanctuary. They would come into big church for a few minutes, and they would sit down uh, on, uh, on the, the floor in front of the pastor, and he'd get a stool out, and he would sit there, and he would tell them a children's story and interact with them for just a few minutes, and then kick them out of big church and send them back over to, to kids' church. So in this one particular church, it was their Sunday to do that, and the pastor was discussing the story of Jonah. And he quoted the scripture out of the book which said, The Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah up onto dry land. And when the pastor finished that verse, trying to engage the kids in what he was talking about, he asked him a question. He said, So boys and girls, what does the fish vomiting Jonah out on dry land teach us today? One of the little boys was waving his hand, waving his hand, and he spoke up without even being called on. And he said, Pastor, it proves that even a fish can't stomach a bad preacher. Oh, out of the mouth of kids, reality comes. Well, I hope I don't give anyone indigestion today. But what we're going to do this morning is we're going to examine some attitudes. Um, And maybe it'll give us a 
a mirror into our own attitudes today. First of all, let, let's talk about what is our attitude at this very moment about the story of Jonah. It, it, this is a biographical story of one man and his relationship with God and his difficult time of carrying out what God wanted to do in him and through him. You see, the real question, and it has been a question that they've answered in every generation, is the book of Jonah a book of truth, or is it a work of fantasy and fiction? And I think what we believe about that, what our attitude is about Jonah will significantly impact what our attitude about God is, or maybe I should say that the other way around. Maybe our attitude about God will determine what our attitude about the book of Jonah is. There was a girl who was traveling on an airplane. She was about nine or ten years old. The man that was sitting next to her noticed that she was reading a storybook entitled Jonah and the Whale. The man asked if the little girl believed the story. After they had said hello, he asked her to tell him about the book. And she said, well, you know, it's the story of Jonah. And he was swallowed by a, a really, really big fish. And, and the man looked at the little girl and said, you really don't believe that, do you, honey? The little girl said, of course I do. The story of Jonah is true. And he said, you mean you really believe that a man can be swallowed by a whale, stay inside of him for three days, and then come out alive? And the little girl thought about it for a moment and said, absolutely. We've studied this in Sunday school. It's in the Bible. I believe it. She thought for a moment. And she said, you know what? When I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Jonah. And the gentleman looked at the little girl and said, well, honey, what if Jonah's not in heaven? And without missing a beat, she looked at him and said, then you can ask him. <laughs> Kids are smart. Kids are smart. But today, I don't want you to take the validation of a smart little girl. I want you to take the validation of Jesus himself. You see, the only other time that Jonah's name is mentioned in the Scriptures is in the Gospel of Luke chapter 11 and the Gospel of Matthew chapter 12. It's two of the Gospel writers telling the same story. They were both present and they penned it down in the, in the journal. You see, the Pharisees are attempting to trick Jesus. They're trying to diminish the popularity and the power that Jesus is having within their community and within their group of faith followers. And so they're trying to trick him in some form or fashion. And so let me just read to you out of Matthew 12 how this conversation goes. Some of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law said to Jesus, Teacher, we, we want to see a sign from you. Prove to us you are who you say you are. <laughs> Listen to his answer. He did not take the... Um, Dale Carnegie class on how to win friends and influence people. Jesus looked at the Pharisees and the teachers and he said, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given except for this, the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men and women of Nineveh will stand up at judgment to this generation and condemn you, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. Do you understand what Jesus was saying? He was saying, folks, the story of Jonah is true. If you can't believe the story of Jonah, how are you going to believe that I will be resurrected from the dead in just a little while? It's not any harder for God to have a fish swallow a man than it is for God to resurrect the dead. The only sign you're going to get. In fact, guys, the only confusion there ought to be about the story of Jonah is the confusion it might cast upon Easter week. And when I say confusion, this is nothing to be troubled about. The few hours I'm talking about don't make a difference in what Christ did for us. It might make a difference on the day we think Jesus was buried. Three days and what? Three nights. Hmm. For three nights to be accomplished, that's Thursday night, Friday night, 
Saturday night. We're not going there today. Just thought I'd have some fun with you on that one. But you see, there was a special Sabbath during that week because it was Passover week. And so the thoughts are Jesus had to be off the cross before the end of the day Thursday before the extra Sabbath on Friday. Oh, I said I wasn't going to talk about that. Anyway, according to Jesus, though, it is the story of Jonah that would be the validation to his pending resurrection. To deny the events of Jonah is equivalent of saying that Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, is a liar. And I don't know about you, I don't want to go there. You see, if we have an understanding of God's character... If we understand his omniscience, he knows all things. His omnipresence, he's everywhere. And his omnipotence, he is all-powerful. If we believe in creation and Noah's flood and David slaying Goliath with a well-flung stone, if we believe the walls of Jericho came tumbling down and that God could part the waters of a sea and a river, if we believe that Elijah was fed from the skies by ravens and was carted to heaven by a fiery chariot, then why is it so hard to believe that God could put a condo in the belly of a big fish? If we cannot believe the grace of God couldn't pursue Jonah so he could take the message of salvation and redemption to a corrupt city like Nineveh, then how can you and I believe that God would send his only begotten son from heaven to earth to deal with a corrupt society on this world, allow him to be crucified on a cross for our sins, and then three days later raise him from the dead for our redemption and our regeneration? You see, to deny the book of Jonah is in essence to deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Hebrews says it well. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Sherlock Holmes, you remember him? He had a sidekick named Watson. They were camping one night, and in the middle of the night, Sherlock Holmes awoke, and he looked up at the stars, and he said, Watson, what do you see? Awakened from his sleep, Watson looked up and said, Sherlock, I see stars. Yes, yes, there, there are stars there. But, but, but what, what do these stars tell you, Watson? Watson rubbed the sleep out of his eyes and said, well, Cosmologically, they tell me that we are part of a large universe. We are one of billions of billions of planets. Theologically, they tell me that we have a great God who made it all. Meteorologically, they tell me that the sky is very clear and we're going to have good weather tomorrow. Temporarily, they tell me that this is the middle of the night and we ought to be sleeping, Sherlock. What do they tell you? (laughs) Sherlock looked around and said, well, Watson, they tell me somebody stole our tent. So let me ask you this morning, what do you see when you look at your life and your relationship with God? What is it that you see? Has, has someone stole your faith? Has someone stole your obedience? Has someone stole or have you lost your commitment? You see, as we look at the first chapter of Jonah, We're looking at what it means to run from God and to see the risks that come with running away from God. Uh, Turn to Jonah if you haven't already done that, chapter chapter 1. I'm going to do something that's very hard for me, and I'm going to do it very quickly, and that is I'm going to read the entire chapter without saying anything about what I read. Yeah, you've been here before, but we, we, we came close in the last service. Here we go. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah, he ran away from the Lord and he headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for the port. After paying his own fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea. He's pursuing him. Oh, I said I wasn't going to do that. And such a violent storm arose, the ship threatened to break him. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God. Lots of religions there that day. And they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. 
But Jonah had gone below the deck where he laid down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us because theirs wasn't and we won't perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who's responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lots fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who's responsible for making all this trouble. What did you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? And from what people are you? He answered, I'm a Hebrew and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made this sea and all the land. This terrified them and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he said. It'll become calm. I know that it's my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land. These were men who wanted to do what was right. But they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. And then they cried to the Lord, same Lord that Jonah was talking about. Oh, Lord, please do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man for you. Oh, Lord, have done as you please. Then he, they took Jonah, threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and they made vows to him. A runaway preacher leads a shipload of men to the God of creation. Is that not amazing? God uses imperfection. But, last verse, but the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights. I, I hate to make this reference. If my mother was here, she would think I'm being crass. However, I've discovered that as you read the Scripture, anytime you see the word but at the beginning of a sentence, it's worthy of closer examination. If you notice in verse 3, but Jonah ran away from the Lord. You get to verse 17, but the Lord provided a great fish to swallow a runaway Jonah. Just an interesting observation. When we start comparing buts, God always wins. Every single time, He always wins. Well, we've briefly talked about our attitude towards the book of Jonah. Let's look at what this first chapter of Jonah reveals us about Jonah's personal attitude. You see, he has a reluctant attitude, and this reluctant attitude leads to extreme rebellious actions. That is a formula that re replicates itself in our own lives. When you and I have a reluctant attitude to respond to the will and the Word of God in our lives, that reluctant attitude will lead to rebellious actions every single time. There's never the action preceding the attitude. The attitude precedes the action. The word of the Lord came and Jonah ran away. Verses 1 and 3. When he ran away, he went in the wrong direction. He went in the opposite direction of where God wanted him to go. He headed towards Tarshish, and the scripture, please take note, it says, and he went down. And then it says in verse 3, and he fled from the Lord. And it said, while he did this, he had to pay the price himself. He bought a one-way ticket out of town. Let's understand something. Tarsus and Joppa weren't necessarily bad places. When I say Tarsus, what pops in your mind? Saul, yeah, Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul the Apostle. It was a, not a bad town, all right? Place of good educational opportunities, place where, where Saul grew up. But Tarsus and Joppa were just not the right place for Jonah at this time. And even though Jonah was going in the wrong direction, he still hadn't hit rock bottom. There's a, a principle in Celebrate Recovery, it's a principle in all of recovery, that says you won't make a change in your life until you finally hit bottom. Have you ever looked at a family member or a friend of yours who needed recovery, 
and wonder to yourself, how can they go any lower? And yet they usually can. It's, it's true for Jonah. He went the wrong direction. And then verse 5 says, not only did he on a boat go in the wrong direction, he then went below deck. Below deck wasn't low enough. Verse 15 says, then the other sailors threw him overboard. That wasn't low enough yet. It says, then a big fish swallowed him up, and he went to the bottom of the belly of a fish. You see, any time that you and I, and, and the part I want you to understand about this, this is not a non-believer running from God. This is one of God's prophets running from him. This, this is you and me. Just, just put your name in this story instead of Jonah's. When we run away from God, it is always a downward spiral. And what is your bottom? His running from God didn't only cause problems for Jonah, but it caused problems for others around him, like the sailors. It put them in a position they never should have been placed in. They had to throw him into the deep blue sea. This story reveals a lot about Jonah and his personal prejudice against the Ninevites. The Ninevites were an ungodly people. You can read about them in other parts of the Old Testament. Don't have time to go there today. Maybe Mark or Kyle will do that in the weeks to come. But Jonah hated the Ninevites. He was a man who loved God, but he had a prejudice so big that prejudice prompted him to run from God. You see, God asked Jonah to share his faith in a place that Jonah did not want to go to a people that Jonah did not like with a promise of success that he did not want. Lousy attitude. This book also reveals us something about God's attitude. God's attitude is revealed about a city that was in desperate need of repentance. And it leads God to some extreme acts of grace to see to their recovery. And these extreme acts of grace are not only the recovery of an entire city and community, but they're acts of grace for recovery of Jonah's life too. I don't want to delve into chapters 2, 3, or 4. That's for Mark and Kyle to do in the next few weeks. But I do want to draw your attention to the last verse of the book. Chapter 4, verse 11. And I actually want to draw your attention to the last sentence. He's just told, told how big the city of Nineveh was. It's 120,000 plus people. Big town. And God asked Jonah, should I not be concerned about such a great city? This reveals to us the heart of God. And the question that you and I should be asking today is, if we are a believer in God and we say we're a follower of Christ, shouldn't the things that concern God concern us? And if God sins, shouldn't we go? He's probably not going to send most of us to a place called Nineveh. I got news for you. He's not going to send very many of you to Africa. So don't get worried about the place yet, folks. But is he going to send you across the dining room table to a spouse or a son or a daughter? Is he going to send you next door to a neighbor or to the hospital to visit a friend whose life is being held by a thread? And if he sins, will you go? Shouldn't the things that concern God concern us? God's amazing grace, his attitude towards people is seen in this book. When people run from God like Nineveh had, like Jonah's now doing, God still pursues. Jonah paid for a cruise to run away from God. But God said, I got you, Jonah. I'm not going to leave you to keep running. I'm going to pursue you. And when I catch up with you, I'll pay your one-way ticket back to shore. <laughs> I'm not sure that's the cruise he had in mind. We see God's attitude of using less than perfect people to accomplish his perfect plan. We see God's patience in disciplining his own children. Let me see if I can wrap this up in about five or six minutes and make this as personal as I can. 
Just as God had a directive for Jonah in this book, God has a directive for your life in this time. He's not going to ask you to write a book of the Bible and for it to be recorded for all of history in the future to read about you. But God is writing in the tablet of your heart. He wants to write his story. And he has a plan and a purpose for you. Are you going to respond to his call and his concerns or are you going to run away? What are you going to do now? Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.20, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, written to all of us, not just to leadership in a church, not just to pastors, all of us who have been redeemed by the grace of God, we have been called to be ambassadors, walking advertisements of deity, Christ in us, imploring others on God's behalf, be reconciled to God himself. The scripture says that God has given us gifts Every one of us who are his children, we have a gift or we have multiple gifts. Are we using them for his purpose, for his glory? The scripture says that Christ lives in us. Are we turning him loose in our lives? The scripture says the fruit of the Spirit abides in all of us as believers. It's there so it can grow up and be seen in the world around us. Are you letting the fruit of the Spirit grow? I understand that God's assignments are not always popular. Nineveh was a disgusting place to go. It's not always lucrative. Jonah's probably not going to be paid a cent. They're they're not always anticipated. But I will tell you this, God's assignments are always right. This assignment to Jonah did not feel right to him. But Jonah's feelings were wrong. That is why you and I are to live on the basis of the truth of God's word and not by the feelings of our moods on any given day. Jonah's defiance might reflect our own. But Jonah, what prompted him to run? He saw a task that was difficult. What could one man do in such a big town? He saw that it was dangerous. The city was wicked. Look at at Nahum chapter 3 and you'll see how wicked the the town was. He he was filled with disgust for those people. He hated them. Is there a prejudice in your life? I don't know, but you do. Is there a prejudice that exists in you? Have you been offended or hurt by someone? Maybe you're a Democrat and some Republican has annoyed you. Maybe you're a Republican and some Democrat has frustrated you. Maybe from you're from one culture that's different than somebody else's and somebody has said something offensive. I'm an oaky Indian cowboy by birth. Boy, everybody offends me. (laughs) Sometimes as we talk about society's challenges and issues, we allow prejudice to be built in our heart. And God says, "I've, I've placed you into this world as my children to be a redemptive solution to the problems that we face. God's love. That doesn't mean that we say yes to all the immorality that is in our world. What was Jonah sent to Nineveh to do? (laughs) To tell them about their immorality. Go, Go back and read those first few verses. Nineveh was an offense to God. Jonah was to go and tell them what those offenses were. Until we understand that decisions that we make are sinful, we'll never repent of that sin. And somebody has to tell them. But Jonah knew that if he told them the truth and they responded to the truth, God would save them and forgive them. And Jonah didn't want that. He wanted them to be crushed, killed. Jonah's downfall probably mirrors our own downfalls. We head in the wrong direction. I don't know of anybody else who's ended up in the belly of a fish in the deep blue sea, but the whole story is, is there's nowhere you can go that you can hide from God. He will pursue you to his very last breath. God will go to great extremes to deliver us. Not only those of us who are sinners so we can become his children, but once we're his children and we choose to run away from him, he will go to great lengths. In this story, he sent a great storm. He provided a great fish. (laughs) He also provided a little bitty worm to get his attention. Uh, God sent a storm, provided a fish so that a great city could hear a great message and be rescued. 
God can save anyone from anywhere. Somebody said God can save from the gutter most to the utter most. Though our sins be as scarlet, rich or poor, brown, black, white, whatever color you want to put, God loves us all. And our sins can be made white as snow. I wanted to end by playing a short video, but I don't have time. So I'm going to read you the words. It's, it was a Veggie Tales video. It would have been so much fun. It was a, a song in a Veggie Tale where they tell the story of Jonah. But instead of doing that, I'm just going to read you the words from that song because they're pretty powerful. You're feeling pretty blue. You didn't do what God requested. Yeah, I'd be moping too if I was going to be digested. That ain't a pretty picture. No, I said it ain't a pretty sight. No, you ran from God this morning and your whale chow tonight. But hold on, hang on, not so fast. Your life ain't over yet. See, we're here to tell you all about the forgiveness you can get. You see, God's a God of mercy and God's a God of love. And right now he's going to lend a helping hand from above. Praise the Lord, he's the God of second chances. You'll be floored how his love your life enhances. You can be restored from your darkest circumstances. Our God is a God of second chances. If you say you're sorry for all the stuff you do, know that he is ready with a second chance for you. Praise the Lord, he is the God of second chances. You can be restored from your darkest circumstances. Our God is a God of second chances. Any of you running from God today? I'm going to give you a storm warning. If you run from God, there's a storm brewing. There might even be a great fish looking to swallow you up. God would much prefer that you hear him out of the whirlwind. And he's saying to you, it's time to come home. God, I'm sorry. He already knows. He just wants you to know it. And he will come running quickly like the prodigal father. And he'll give you a new garment to wear. And he'll put a new crown on your head and new shoes on your feet and a new ring on your finger that says, I am a child of God and I'm going in the right direction. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for preserving the story of Jonah. I think so many in the world want to deny its reality because it reveals too much to us about ourselves. And we don't like that. Um, well, if this is your first time with us, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, my name is Kyle Relf, one of the pastors here, and today I get the absolute honor and privilege of being able to, I guess, lead through uh, this next passage that we're going to be going through in our study through the book of Jonah. And if you're watching online, thank you again so much uh, for, for joining us. Um, so yeah, like I said, we're going through the book of Jonah, but today we're going to be in chapter 2. So if you would, please go ahead, open up your Bibles, turn on your phone, the whatever app you use, or however you do, uh, please open to the book of Jonah chapter 2. And as you all are trying to find that, I would like to ask um, a very simple question to start us off. That question is this, how many of you like to watch movies? Yeah, all right, so a lot of us. The few of you that didn't raise your hands, I'm sorry that you enjoy a boring life, um, but this is, uh, for me, I love watching movies, and I studied how to make movies. That is what my degree is in, uh, which is fun, and because of that, I got to watch a lot of different kinds of movies, and when you... And, all sorts of different movies, books, whatever, you'll see a plethora of different stories, right? So you might have like a heist movie, like a heist kind of story. You might have like a coming of age story for young people, or you might even have romance stories. 
And within those different stories, you will have themes that bridge across all of them. You might have the same theme in a horror movie as you would in like an animated classic, uh, which is really interesting. But one of the very many different kinds of themes and one that is common that you can see regularly is this idea of deep friendships with other people, or this idea of people being there for each other regardless of the circumstance. One of the first few movies that I think of uh, that fits that theme uh, is the movie Goodwill Hunting. Have any of you ever seen the movie Goodwill Hunting? Yeah, great movie, classic. I don't cry much during movies, but that one is one where I'll watch it and be like, I would like to cry during this, because uh, it's intense. But for those that have not, seen this movie is about this young man who is a janitor at uh, MIT. You find out he's got this brilliant mind for mathematics. Incredible student, uh, but unfortunately, he, keep, he is the one that is responsible for holding himself back. He gets in trouble with the law all the time to the point where one of the math teachers from the school decide to help intervene and gets him out of jail, but tells him, hey, you know, one of the requirements, if, if you're going to let me help you in this way, is you have to meet with a psychologist once a week. Uh, and that psychologist is played by Robin Williams. And although uh, this person is hired to be there and to help him through whatever struggles he's going through, Robin Williams' character, we find, is one of the only few people that consistently show up for Will and are there and present for him. He even gets to, uh, towards... Um, in the movie, we see uh, Robin Williams' character addressing the abuse that Will had experienced, which caused him into the kind of lifestyle that he lives. And because of uh, his character, Robin Williams' character's own experience through his own abuse that he had suffered from the hand of his own dad, you see him lead Will into this incredible breakthrough moment where he, he reminds him that it is not his fault. Right? And that, that pinnacle moment in that movie, Robin Williams reminds him again and again, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. And it's this powerful breakthrough moment where we get to see one man who is there for the sake of someone else. Or here's another movie that I'm sure there's only one person in this room that has seen that other than me, and I know it's my wife because I made her watch it when uh, we were dating, uh, and it's a small indie movie that I watched uh, when I was in college called Short Term 12, uh, and in this movie, you see this young woman named Grace who works at this halfway house for uh, teens and kids within the foster care system, so pretty heavy subject matter as it is. Um, but uh, these at-risk youth, there's this one girl who comes into the facility who uh, has, is there because of abuse that she had experienced within her family, with her dad, and, uh, but she has it in her mind that uh, she will be able to get out of that place. Her dad will come and pick her up, and she'll be able to go live in this perfect, carefree environment with her abusive father. This woman, Grace, uh, comes in, and has a special attachment to this young girl and wants to help her through that because she herself, as we find out later in the movie, has experienced her own set of abuse by her own father. And so by the end, we see her, Grace, coming alongside and helping this young girl and to the point of breaking the rules of what you can do legally, showing up to this girl's house and is there for her and is there with her in her struggle and is able to empathize with her. Or how about this? This one, uh, this last movie is a little bit lighter in subject matter, but it's a movie about an unsuspecting friendship that unfolds over the course of an adventure. You have one uh, person that after losing their land to the governing authority is promised his land back after accomplishing a very specific task. And along the way, this person acquires a companion that he normally would not want anything to do with. But as they go along their journey, they create this very unique bond. Can anyone guess this movie? It is, in fact, the 2001 animated classic Shrek. Has anyone else seen this movie? It's by far one of my favorites, so 
stick with me here. But within this masterpiece of cinema uh, that we get to experience, Shrek, who is an ogre, is companioned with his friend Donkey, who is a donkey, uh, and they end up splitting their ways over a secret that Donkey had to keep in this experience of going along this task to rescue Princess Fiona, who is locked away in the highest room of the tallest tower guarded by a fire-breathing dragon. Incredible film. Truly a work of art. But on the journey back to Lord Farquaad, Shrek begins to have romantic feelings for Fiona, but then Donkey, in a secret conversation with her, finds out that she actually herself turns into an ogre when the sun comes down. And that will be resolved with true love's first kiss. Mm. In the middle of this conversation between Fiona and Donkey, Shrek is away, trying to figure out a way how he's going to go and profess his love to her. Uh, But in this conversation, Fiona ends up telling Donkey, how could anyone love an ogre? And she says that right as Shrek is at the door, absolutely crushing his heart. And so out of his anger and frustration, he goes to retrieve Lord Farquaad in the early mornings, or in the early morning, bring her back and ends up splitting ways with Donkey. How could he? Donkey's alone, but he hears that the wedding of Fiona and Lord Farquaad are, are going to be the next day, so he rushes over to Shrek's swamp and meets him there in his depression and says, Shrek, you need to fight for the woman that you love and gets him out of there as a true friend would, showing up with his buddy, the ogre, and telling him and convincing him to do what is right. Now, This passage in Jonah that we're going to read doesn't have anything to do with abuse or ogres or talking donkeys, but we do get to see the same kind of level of love and idea of friendship, but not just with like a buddy or someone that you know closely, but we're truly with the creator of the universe. So we get to see that God provides us with that same kind of presence and with who he is regardless of our circumstance. So with that, I'm going to follow suit with what Pastor Tim did last week, and we're going to read through the entire chapter as a whole. There's only 10 verses, so it shouldn't be too bad, uh, but we're going to be reading through the entire chapter two together, if you would follow along with me. Starting at verse one. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shout of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah into dry land. So, a couple of notes here about this passage. The first thing to take note of is that this passage is actually poetry. So if you're reading in your Bible, you might notice that the words are kind of smushed together in the middle of the column, um, that typically in the written form means that there's something like a poem or a song, something specific about how this is written. But when translating this passage into English, it's really hard to communicate the alliteration and the rhyme scheme and everything from the original Hebrew language. So we don't get the full impact of the poetry itself, but this is the best that we can do message-wise with the translation. And the other thing to know about this passage and why it's important to know that this is poetry is that this poem directly reflects another poem that uh, is said and read, prayed through later on uh, in the book of Jonah. Uh, the other thing 
as well is that within Jonah's prayer, he's actually quoting scripture. Uh, his, uh, the, when he prayed, and we read through this, he's actually referencing and recalling a lot of different psalms. And so what I'm going to do is ask you guys to keep your Bibles on Jonah 2, and we're going to look at the different references that he makes, and then check that with the, uh, with the verses. And so in verse 2 of Jonah, chapter 2, he's actually referencing Psalm 120, verse 1, and Psalm 18, verse 6. And those say this, I call on the Lord in my distress, and he answers me. Psalm 18, in my distress, I called to the Lord. I cried to my God for help. From his temple, he heard my voice. My cry came before him into his ears. Now let's look at that with Jonah chapter 2, verse 2. We won't have it up on the screen, so you're going to have to look at your Bibles. It says, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead I called for help, and you listened to my cry. Pretty, uh, pretty precise there. Now in verse 3 of chapter 2 of Jonah, he actually references Psalm 88, verse 6, and Psalm 42, verse 7. Psalm 88. You have put me in the lowest pit in the darkest depths. Psalm 42, deep calls to deep, and the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. Now let's reference that to Jonah chapter 2, verse 3. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. Again, direct quote, a direct recall and, and reference to this psalm. Now, verse 4 references uh, Psalm 31, 22, which says, In my alarm I said, I am cut off from your sight, yet you heard my cry for mercy and you called for my help. Jonah 2, 4, I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again for, towards your holy temple. Verse 5 references Psalm 69, 1 and 2. It says, Save me, O God, from the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in the miry depths where there is no foothold. I've come to the deep waters, the floodgates, uh, the floods engulf me. Verse 9 references a few of these different psalms, starting, we have Psalm 31, 6, Psalm 50, verses 14 and 23, and Psalm 3, verse 8. Won't have these up on the screen, but Psalm 31, 6 says, I hate those who cling to worthless idols. As for me, I trust in the Lord. Psalm 50, verse 14. Sacrifice thanks offerings to God. Fulfill your vows to the Most High. Psalm 50, verse 23. Those who sacrifice thanks offerings honor me, and to the blameless I will show my salvation. Psalm 3, 4. I call to the Lord, and he answers me from his holy mountain. So you can see in every single part of this prayer that Jonah is saying back to God, he is knowing and recalling his, God's own scriptures. And he's a prophet, so it makes sense that he would know the word of God. So with this in mind, our initial read-through of this passage might lead you to think very specific thoughts, or at least very positive thoughts, about Jonah's response to being in the belly of this fish. You see a man trying to return to God, he knows his scriptures, and so he's quoting them back to God and maybe as a sign of repentance. He desires obedience. And based off of this last comment that he makes, he's saying that he will then go and tell the people that salvation does, in fact, belong to the Lord. And he's reaching out to the Lord from the depths of his own trouble. And within that, he acknowledges that it is, in fact, God who will then deliver him from it. You know, it's the same way that Donkey came back to save Shrek from the pit of despair that he was feeling in his swamp and encourages him to go and fight for the woman that he loves. But here is God taking Jonah out of the pit of despair and telling him what to do and telling him how to do it right. And these statements and observations are good lessons to glean from. They're true, they're accurate. They're biblical and the right ways to think about how we respond to God. But what I'd like to do is go back through this chapter and see if maybe there's something else that is below the surface. 
because sometimes we can't really take it just at face value because we know that there's more going on within this story and especially within the context of this book as a whole and the story that is being played out that we are studying. There's more happening. And so what I'd like to do is go back through this and actually try to figure out the character of Jonah and figure out his actual response to God. And the way I would like to do this is by taking more of a critical eye through this chapter. Now, most of the observations that I had were made uh, in this article that I read by pastor and writer David Schrock, who wrote a couple of articles on the use of Psalms within Jonah's prayer, as well as the heart of Jonah himself in this. So the first thing to observe as we look back now at chapter one, we see that yes, Jonah is actively running away from God, right? He is, God tells him, hey, go preach to the people of Nineveh. And he's like, I'm going to go that way instead. And so he moves on, does his own thing. There is a treacherous water that he's trapped in. He even gets to the point of acknowledging that it is his fault that the storm is happening. But who prays in that? Because it's not Jonah. It's the sailors, right? Right? They're the ones that pray to God. Now, they're not saying, like, Lord, give us an answer. They're praying to God to say, hey, don't hold us accountable as we throw this dude overboard. Because they revere and respect this person, this God that they don't know. Because obviously, he is making this happen to prove a point. So they're praying and asking for the Lord for, for not to hold them accountable, hold it against them. So now let's look at chapter two, like we just read. Now, what I'd like you guys to do is to scan through quickly-ish chapter two, look over it, and see if you can find anywhere where uh, Joseph, (laughs) where Jonah confesses his sin. Look through chapter two right now and see if you can find anywhere where Jonah actually confesses his sin of disobedience to God. As you're looking, you won't find it. It's not there. You can see that he's thankful to God for saving him. In the NIV, he says that he'll give a shout of grateful praise. And he says that he'll give a sacrifice. But he never once confesses his sin of disobedience to God. Towards the end of the passage, we actually see him kind of point the finger at those who worship worthless idols, saying that they are the ones that are actively turning away from God. And his response to that is, but I will make a sacrifice, but I will do this. And he's making it about himself, that he's actually better than these people who worship worthless idols. And he's saying that he will make good on this vow that he's Because he's making good on this vow, he will actually be better than these other people. What else do we see? Well, we see in verses 3, it seems like Jonah is actually blaming God for the situation that he's in. Now, again, he's quoting Psalms, so there's other scripture involved. But even the Psalms that he's quoting was from a point of view when David was in complete distress. This is his point of view. But in verse 3, he says, You hurled me into the depths. Your waves and breakers swept over me. It's almost like one of those like not apologies that people give. Like, well, I'm sorry that you were offended by what I said. Like it's kind of like pointing the finger in another direction and not taking accountability. It's like Jonah here is blaming God for the suffering that he's in. Now, this last observation isn't really mentioned in chapter 2, but it's also not mentioned anywhere else in the book of Jonah. The last thing is that he doesn't actually fully follow through with what he says. Did he go to Nineveh? Yeah, he went to Nineveh. So he's kind of obedient. But does he make the sacrifice that he said that he would? No. And we'll, we'll read chapter 3 and 4 in the next couple of weeks. But nowhere else in the book of Jonah do we see him actually completely following through. So he's, he's kind of obedient, but it's like this reluctant obedience. 
It's almost like a kid who's like pouting as he needs to go and clean his room. He's like, you know, I'm going to go do it, but I guess I will, you know, like mad. Like he still doesn't want to, but he's going to anyway. So it's like kind of there. But that's what it's like. He's, he's like a child going and following through with what he says. So here in this book, we have this very smart, this very learned man who knows his scripture and even talks with God, but whose heart is gravely in question. We see him turn from God, yes. And in this passage, as he's praying, it seems like he's trying to make a positive return back to him. But when we look deeper at it, you can see that it's not actually a true confession from one man of his sin to God. And it lacks this humble return. So what does this mean for us today? You know, it's kind of like a downer, like, oh man, this guy actually sucks. So what does this mean for us? The first thing that we should acknowledge and pull from this is that no matter what our circumstances, no matter where we find ourselves, good or bad, God meets us where we are. It doesn't matter if we're at the bottom of the belly of a fish or at the peak of our success, God will meet us there. The other point is that the truth and the word of God should ultimately lead us into repentance. In our knowledge of God and our knowledge of his word, we should then be driven back to God and who he is. So this first point, no matter where we find ourselves, God will meet us where we are. If you weren't with us last week, Pastor Tim mentioned that we can't always anticipate where it is that God will take us. We won't be able to fully predict where we'll end up, but we can know and be confident that wherever it is, God will meet us there. And I think from a head knowledge kind of point of view, Jonah knew that. Like he quoted enough scripture and he knows enough about God to know that he is with him, that Yahweh will, will deliver him. Even at the end of his passage, he references that salvation ultimately comes from the Lord. And there's so many other scriptures that speak of this as well that Jonah even would have known. Scriptures like Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Jonah would have known this if he's quoting so many other Psalms. Or even Psalm 107, verse 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Even after Jonah's time, there's scriptures that we now on this, this side of things, we can read and still see the same character of God even for us. We have passages like 1 Chronicles 16.34, which is really just a, a retelling and, and re-quoting what David had written down in this psalm. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. We also have Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7, which says, Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Literally, the the peace of God will stand like a guard in front of the doorway to your heart and the doorway to your mind and protect you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I mean, even think about the story of Zacchaeus, right? He was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. I don't know if anybody else grew up singing those Sunday school songs, but... You have this person of Zacchaeus who wants to see the the man Jesus coming down the road. So he climbs up into a tree, spots him. And Zacchaeus, being a tax collector, being an, an evil man, or at least people saw him as an evil man, Jesus saw him and said, hey, come on, get down, get down from the tree. Let me go to your house. Let's share a meal. And then he went to Zacchaeus' home and told him the truth of who he was and what God's plan was. Like, what a beautiful, intimate interaction of God literally meeting Zacchaeus in his own home to tell him of who he was. We even have verses like Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. 
For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing in this world can ever separate us from the love of God. And so, when things are going bad, what is a typical thing that we do in response? At least something that I do, and I've been doing, and I think a lot of us do, is to pray for comfort, right? We pray, like when a loved one dies, we pray and ask God to comfort the family, or even ourselves to be comforted. Or when life is stressful, money seems tight, things are, are crazy, we pray for ourselves to be comfortable, even. And seeking comfort itself, I don't... Seeking comfort isn't a bad thing. It's not wrong for us to ask God for that. But staying comfortable isn't good. How can we rely on God when we are comfortable and secure in everything that we have? It's in those moments of discomfort when God shows up and shows us exactly who he is, allowing us to trust and grow in our relationship with him. And we see examples of this in both the Old and New Testament. When we read the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, we see the story of Joseph. That's why I laughed when I messed up Joseph and Jonah earlier, because I knew I was going to say his name later. But in the story of Joseph, we have this man who was betrayed by his own family. He was sold into slavery, was wrongly accused of trying to commit adultery with someone else's wife, and yet still worked his way up into a position of authority to pretty much rule secondhand the entire kingdom of Egypt. And at the end of his life, he's having a conversation with his brothers, and his brothers come before him, the men that sold him into that position. And in Genesis 50, verse 20, in this conversation, he says, You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So even Joseph, in this predicament, in this moment, he was able to acknowledge that his suffering wasn't at the fault of God, but rather it was God using his life to then create a better circumstance for the world, for the people of Egypt, and even specifically his family. So yes, we can know and be confident in the fact that God is using our life to mold us and shape us and allow us to grow. But when things are bad, what, what should we do? What's our response? I would say the first thing that we need to do is come before the Lord and acknowledge that he is in fact with us. Because he's not just the God of comfort like we just read. He's, he's doing something good. Maybe not our own good, but he is accomplishing something for us to grow and learn from. So our desire should then to be persevering through whatever bad circumstance we might find ourselves in and receive that peace of mind that goes beyond all understanding. I mean, if you think back to those movies that we were talking about, right? Like in Goodwill Hunting, Robin Williams' character was able to empathize and actually lead Will through this breakthrough moment because of his own experience. And with uh, that movie Short Term 12, this woman, Grace, was able to help lead this young girl through a breakthrough moment because of her own experience. So in both of these stories, the older person has come from a similar suffering in their past and, in, and are able to use that experience to help and to love someone who desperately needed it. And so how much better then is it for us to be able to experience this perfect love from the creator of the universe who has also experienced the same kinds of pain that we experience on a very human and a very real level. But fortunately for us, we may not always be in this place of hardship. Sometimes things are going well, and that's great. When things begin to go well, that's where we need to be careful because oftentimes when things are going so well, we have this tendency to then make it about ourselves. We, we feel this need to hold on to whatever action we're doing that is accomplishing the success so that way we can repeat success after success after success and continue to see this good happen. 
and inherently we're making it about ourselves and our own works and our own good. And what we need to do is to be sure to give all glory back to God. And that's even where we can pick up a little bit from this, this prayer that Jonah is making. Like even he says that we can, he can give shouts of grateful praise because salvation ultimately comes from the Lord. You know, in that Philippians passage we quoted earlier, it says, rejoice in the Lord always. It literally says, again, I say rejoice. And the reason we can rejoice in the Lord and everything is because of what it says in James chapter 1, verse 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. And so as good things come our way, we can acknowledge the Lord's hand in our success. Because if we don't, then we begin to take credit for his goodness and for his kindness. And so the second point, that the truth and the word of God should ultimately lead us to repentance. Who God is and what God is doing was just not enough for Jonah. He even had gifts, specific gifts that were given to him by Yahweh. He had a direct connection to the voice of God. He would literally receive words from God to then share it with other people, and yet that wasn't enough. So he knew who God was. He even studied his scriptures. He at least knew enough psalms to compose this entire prayer that he had. And what this reminds me of is so many Christians, even here today, who can know their Bible. They've listened to enough sermons. They might read it every once in a while. And they do a lot of things that are inherently right. But unless their hearts are fully changed, and unless our hearts are fully transformed by the renewal of our mind then we won't actually have a true intimacy with God. Because in Matthew, 20, or Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 through 23, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Drive out demons in your name. Perform many miracles. Then I will say to them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So even in this verse, Jesus is telling these people that they may have done things. They did things in his name. They performed miracles in his name, and yet God does not acknowledge them. So just because we have a char- uh, knowledge of the character of God and we know his word, it does not mean that we have an intimate relationship with him. I want you right now, let's think of somebody that you may know, maybe not personally, not not like your spouse, but someone else that you know um, that is alive today. Might be barista at whatever coffee shop you go to, might be somebody like Elon Musk or even, you know, like Pastor Mark, right? Think about that person in your mind And think about how well do you actually know them? How well do you know this person? You might have a lot of knowledge of certain details, like Pastor Mark, right? He's British. So that automatically makes him way more enjoyable to listen to on a Sunday morning. So I'm sorry that I don't have that shame, that same uh, excitement to my voice. (laughs) You might even know that his favorite dessert is chocolate cake. You might also know that he is pre-diabetic, so you really need to be careful with that information that you have about chocolate cake. And you might even know how many years that he and his wife, Jen, uh, have been married and who they went to go see in concert. You know, you might know a lot of these, this information about him, but it doesn't mean that you actually know who Mark is. And the book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis is talking about a belief in God, and he, said, he equates it to knowing about the uh, city of New York, New York City, right? He says that you can know New York City, but until you've actually gone there and walked the streets, you can't have any kind of knowledge. You can have a belief, but you can't have a full knowledge of what that city is like. It's like a, a marriage with my wife, right? Sorry, honey, I'm putting you on the spot. Gianna can literally anticipate my behavior and the things that I say because she sees me every single day. 
She interacts with me every single day. She hasn't just gotten to know things about me and my hobbies and my likes and dislikes, but rather she's actually gotten to know what makes who I am. And she's paid attention to it. It's the same thing with God. We can know a lot about God. We can have a lot of information about who God is. I mean, the Bible is the most easily accessible book in the entire world. One of the most easily accessible books. I think actually the most easily accessible book. And the internet is filled, filled with amazing articles, sermons, podcasts, videos, with information about God and about the Bible. We have so much information But if we don't actually let that change our lives and change our hearts and minds, then our words are ultimately meaningless. We have scriptures like Romans 12, 2 that says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. This transformation that we seek and should be desiring ultimately comes from the renewing of our mind and that happens the more that we get to know who God is. Just because Jonah was a prophet, just because he knew his scripture and just because he was actually, he went and was used by God to save the city of Nineveh doesn't mean that he was earnestly seeking God. So as we acknowledge our despair and brokenness and our pain, let that be what motivates us into a a, a true relationship with Christ. And let that transform our thinking. What's amazing about Jonah's prayer is that he himself ultimately acknowledges that salvation comes from the Lord. He says that. He claims it. And what's amazing, and I don't even think he would have known, is how amazingly prophetic that that is even for us today in light of who Christ Jesus is. That's the message for us to acknowledge. And that's the lens that we can read the rest of the Bible through, that salvation ultimately comes from Yahweh. Because in the darkness of our own depravity, we have Christ as our rescuer. Because of our sin, we alienated ourselves from God. And just like Jonah states in his prayer, he acknowledges that people give themselves up to worthless idols, and we do the same. But praise be to God that he sent his own son Jesus into our world in order for, uh, to, to, to rescue us from an eternal separation from him and his goodness. And so within the depths of our sin, we now have Christ as our redeemer. And by his action on the cross, he took on our sin and paid the ultimate penalty for us. And by his blood, we are now redeemed. But that's not something that we can earn. It is not something that we can gain on our own, and it's not even anything that we can deserve. And so within the shame of our own brokenness, we now have Christ as our restorer. Because in the same way that God had Jonah in the belly of a fish for three days, he had his own son, Jesus, in the depths of death in order to conquer it because of his love for his creation. The heart of God is to always provide a way out. And in the same way that Jonah was thrown up onto the shore, Jesus himself in his full glory was raised from the dead. And in his resurrection that we even just celebrated a couple of weeks ago, we can now be restored into an intimate and close relationship with the creator of the universe. So with that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you sent Jesus into our world to experience pain, to experience suffering, so that way in his death, burial, and resurrection, we can now have a life with you. That because of his experience and your knowledge of your creation, God, we know we could trust you and we know that you are with us. And so even now, I pray, Lord, that we would acknowledge your presence with us even today. That Holy Spirit, you are with us. Doesn't matter if we are experiencing, you know, the loss of someone we loved, if we're experiencing any other kind of pain from any outside source of our own. 
Or maybe, God, our lives are just going really great right now. And in either circumstance, you are with us. And we praise you for who you are through that. And so, God, may the knowledge of your presence and the listening of your word and studying of who you are, may that draw us closer to you. Because, God, we love you and we need you. And it's in your precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, we're going to be in the book of Jonah again. Uh, We're in that series right now. We're going to be in chapter 3 of Jonah. Also a little bit in Psalm 51, if you want to um, put a a bookmark in there as well. But, uh, you know, I I have a love for vintage things. I have a preference over things that are older, things, frankly, that are better made than they are nowadays. Um, When it comes to cars, I would much rather take a, a vintage car over a brand new car. I mean, I don't mean junkers that just happen to be old. I'm talking about you know, vintage classic cars. Um, as a pilot, I would prefer to fly a kerosene lamp. It might look rusted, it might look worn out, but it should be pulled out of the dirt where if it was left, it would just break down into dust eventually and disappear. It should be given a second chance to give out light. And chapter 3 of Jonah starts off with this amazing picture that God won't leave us to rot. He won't leave us in our sin. He won't leave us in our shame. Attempting to separate physically himself from God. But he had a calling for Jonah. God made very clear what this calling was. In chapter 1, verse 2, God speaks to Jonah and says, Go to Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. The very next sentence It says, but Jonah ran away just to ignore the command. He's not just going to stay where he is and decide to cross his arms, you know, like an eight-year-old boy who just asked to take a shower. They stand their ground. I know, I was one once. He decided, I'm going to get out of here. And he took off from Joppa. Joppa, incidentally, the modern equivalent is Tel Aviv in Israel, or part of Tel Aviv in Israel. It's called Jaffa. And he headed out on this 2,500 mile across uh, the ocean to Tarshish. And Tarshish is thought the Mediterranean, 2,500 miles away. Instead of taking the 550 mile northeast journey to Nineveh. Of course, when I say that Tarshish was the logical place to go, if you're trying to escape a person, then yeah, sure, 2,500 miles makes sense. But as we all know, if you're trying to escape from God, it doesn't matter where you go. It's futile. You could go any distance. It doesn't matter. Uh, So not surprisingly, God orchestrates things. He ends up in the belly of a fish, and at the end of chapter 2, we find that Jonah is like vomited up onto land by this fish. And it's at this point that we pick it up in chapter 3, verse 1. And as we've done in the first two chapters, uh, we're just going to read through this chapter in its entirety. It's not very long. It's 10 verses. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent Uh, and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. So this is an example of how in Scripture just 10 verses can be packed with an awful lot of stuff. Go take a shower. God is saying, go to Nineveh. We usually follow it up with, you don't want me to say it again. And I think Jonah's getting this sense of he doesn't want God to say it again because an awful lot of stuff happened last time he ignored him. So he said, fine, I'll go to Nineveh. And I'm sure he was trying to figure out exactly what this message was going to look like when he got to Nineveh. And it wasn't a very uplifting message to report to people. It wasn't one that they would want to hear. But Jonah, and Jonah didn't particularly care for those people, he didn't even think that they were worth warning or worth saving. The last time Nineveh was mentioned in the news here in the U.S., in in modern days, no one particularly wanted to go there either at that time. 
because Nineveh is now Mosul in Iraq. But this is a perfect, there's just no way back. We begin to take on this mindset of like, even if we wanted to go back, there's just too much water that's passed under the bridge. Why would God want to take me back now? I've done too much. I've gone too far. But this is where we underestimate God. We think of him in worldly terms. We feel like he's just going to react to us in the same way that people around uh, react to us. But nothing could be further from the truth. Because the fact is that he is and always has been right by our side. We are the ones that run from him or try to run from him, but he is there. We are the ones that turn our faces away from him, but he is there. We're the ones that distract ourselves so that we don't need to think about the fact that we've turned our back on God, but he is there. And so the first thing we notice in this passage is that God has given Jonah a second, hears the words, and he obeys the words and goes to Nineveh. Jonah's heart was not for Nineveh, however. He may be going, but he feels like it's futile. It says in verse 2 that Nineveh was a very large city, and it took three days to go through it. It's thought that Nineveh actually, around this time period in the 600s, 700s, for decades was the largest city in the world. And it was estimated that for the breadth of, of uh, Nineveh was about 90 miles. So it would take a long time to walk from one side to another, that's for sure, even for a good walker. So Jonah, generally speaking, it's accepted that this means destroyed from the ground up, the foundation up. It wasn't just a casual comment that was saying, you know, things are not going to go well for you guys. It was a picture of the total destruction of the city. Jonah would not have quite known how this message was going to be received, how it was going to go down, hence his hesitation to go to Nineveh in the first place. No one likes to be told that they are so sinful that the Lord is going to strike them down and wipe them out as a culture and as a, as a nation. So he wasn't sure what the reaction was going to be. Because if I was coming to here, if I happened to go down to the city hall of Clovis, that's huge. They believed God. And they went into this posture of repentance, of fasting, of wearing sackcloth. The king himself had a public declaration that anyone, everyone, people, animals alike, could not eat, they could not drink, and they could not wear anything but sackcloth. And they, he called them urgently to go to God. And he's saying, humble yourselves. Change. Pray. Urgently appeal to the Lord for forgiveness. And make amends for all the sin. And um, every month I'd bring the financial statements to the owner of the company. And he was getting more and more agitated with me. Because I was reporting the news. And at the end of the year, when we had not hit any of our sales goals, he turned on me initially. But then we had a discussion about don't shoot the messenger. Because CFOs always are the ones that are reporting this stuff. It's not their fault it happens, it's just that it happens when it's this is salespeople. So eventually he got to the salespeople at the end of the day. But of course they always start off with what well, you point and they saw this urgent need for change. So this isn't about them just deciding to take their God more seriously now. That's why these three words are very important. Or as churches, we feel that uh, culture is going so far in the wrong direction and that it just seems to be that no matter what we do as Christians or churches, uh, things still seem to be going further in the wrong direction in society, perhaps faster than it ever has. That all the morals are, are being questioned. All values are being questioned and discarded in favor of this sort of do-whatever-you-want type attitude. Being okay, And then they brought the gospel to them. They desperately needed to hear the gospel because things were going in the wrong direction. If you look at the Roman Empire, they started off very well. They started off with the highest levels of honor, the highest levels of uh, morality. They were a picture of a civilized nation. They prided themselves in that so much to the point they looked down on everybody else. They must have thought, we have no hope. Things have drifted too far. There's so much violence. There's so much corruption. There's so much lack of leadership. There's so much... In verse 10, it says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented. God changed his mind. He was no longer going to go through with his plan that he had to destroy Nineveh from the ground up. He gave them grace. I think that's one of the most important chapters in the Bible when it comes to understanding how much the Lord God loves us because it's about second chances. It's about the abundant grace of our Lord Jesus uh, in our lives and it stems from the fact that uh, the love of God has no bounds for his people. God chose to change. 
He saw the change in the people of Nineveh, and he changed his plan for them. Everyone who has accepted Christ into their lives has at some point understood what it is to have a second chance. If you think that you don't have that experience in your life, then think again. There's always that opportunity to see the second chances. Because we all need chances. We don't do everything perfect the first time. We fail, we falter, and sometimes we spiritually run away from God. But we always have the option to do it again, to try again. Because God will always continue to use the people that come back to him. We serve a God of second chances. Adam and Eve sinned against God. He didn't just destroy them. He didn't just say, well, that was a bad experiment. Squish, I'll start again. He didn't do that. He gave them an opportunity to continue. He separated them from the Garden of Eden. Yes, there is consequences to our sin, but they continued. Cain murdered his brother Abel. God didn't destroy him for that. He allowed him to have a life somewhere else. He separated him, and he lived to an age of 730 years old. Moses murdered a man and ran, but God came to him, gave him instructions, had a calling for him, and he used him in a powerful way to deliver the, God's people from captivity. Elijah quit, and he complained to God, but God re-engaged him and used him. Peter denied Jesus three times. But then God used him in Pentecost in a very powerful way, and he became a leader of the early church. John Mark, or Mark, deserted the mission team in Pamphylia, but God moved him to write the second gospel. It's about spiritual renewals, yes, in individuals, but also in cultures, in societies, in whole nations. Nineveh is a great example of a genuine spiritual renewal, a revival. And the first thing that needs to be understood about spiritual renewals or revivals is that God, in his sovereignty, in his sovereign judgment, often works to give opportunities to forgive. Even if at the beginning, initially, they don't see the need for forgiveness. The people of Nineveh didn't know that they needed to have forgiveness until Jonah got there. He could have just rained down a storm of destruction on them without any warning. But God knew there was a possibility for change. In his sovereignty, he chose to give them the opportunity to, say, to change. Why them? Why at that particular moment in time? We don't exactly know. But it's possible that God saw an opportunity for big change in the world. They were the largest city. They had the most people in that city that needed him. They, all they had at that time were idols. He knew they needed him. Uh, they had spread so much violence on their missions to, de- de- to destroy and conquer other nations. So maybe this represented God's plan to produce more good in the world, saving the worst people in the world, turning them around. No doubt their violence and pillaging stopped for a short period of time, but in the end, the revival of Nineveh simply was the foreign, uh, so- sovereign work of forgiveness that, is pr- that produced in them a significant change. So we can also pull from this that this type of revival and renewal comes only when there is a proclamation of the word of God. Jonah was told, go proclaim these words to these people, the word of God, and he did. And it had a dramatic effect because it's easy to underestimate the amazing transformational power of the word of God. We can talk around scripture. We can read thousands of peripheral books about scripture We can listen to all the podcasts in the world about Scripture, but the fact is, the bottom line is when we hear or we read God's Word, then it has the ability to speak to us like nothing else we read. Hebrews 4.12 makes it very clear to us. says, For the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart says it's alive and it is active and it is brought to life by the Holy Spirit that dwells in us. And there are times that we read scripture that it does exactly that. It penetrates into our hearts and makes all the difference. So when we try to create renewal of hearts or revivals, to do it without the word of God is futile. It wouldn't have the same effect. And that's what the difference is between just a motivational speech and a sermon. Scripture. It's easier to think about revival, that it comes from our own human skills, it comes from our own abilities. But the reality is that when we, t- we can only take it so far, but God's word is what makes all the difference. 
I could stand here and I could be as eloquent as Winston Churchill or even Martin Luther King Jr. But the reality is if I don't use scripture in my message, then it won't make a lick of difference to your faith. Because it's through this, the Bible, that we understand who God is and what he has done for us. And it's hard to appreciate that without the power of his words. Also, what the word does is it speaks to us in in truth and in love. Jonah's message may not have been the most uplifting one, and frankly, his own personal feelings were not in the right place either when he delivered it, but the message of the Lord (coughs) was done in love, because as we see, it has the ability to change the behaviors of the Ninevites as well as the mind of the Lord himself. So we should speak the word of God in love and in truth. In a true and honest way, it's important to do that. And we cannot be selective about it. And selective means in a couple of different ways. We cannot be selective about what we choose to understand in the Bible, what we choose to use in the Bible. The scripture is all or nothing. We must accept all of scripture. And we must use all of scripture when it comes to our lives. We must use it uh, in a way that it changes us and transforms us and others. So we cannot be selective about what we want to have out of scripture and what we don't want to look at in scripture. But also selective means we, we, must, we must give it to everybody. We cannot be as selective about who we share the gospel with. Paul proclaimed the gospel to everybody that he came across on his missionary of journeys. Jonah went to this specific spot in the world because it was God's command, but no one was exempt from hearing the word. These were the worst people at the time. You'd think of anybody, they were not the ones that wanted to hear it, but he took it to them. And often to whom or where we share the gospel is determined by our own comfort level. What we are willing, not able, but willing to do in the name of the Lord. And consequently, sometimes we feel called to a difficult task of sharing our faith with someone or going somewhere that we don't feel particularly comfortable with. And it's easy to abandon at that point, that calling. Jonah didn't want to go. Eventually he did. And he shared the message with the people. And he was way outside of his comfort zone, even as a prophet. He wasn't comfortable giving God's word to these people, but he did because everyone everywhere needs to hear God's word and have the chance to see transformation and renewal in their own lives and in the lives of the people around them. The most important thing that the people of Nineveh did in response to Jonah's message was to repent. If you remember the story of Pentecost in Acts where Peter was preaching to the people, they heard the gospel of Christ. And then in Acts 2, verse 37, it says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. This is the word of God, cuts to our heart. And said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? And Peter's response was this. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you. And in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. He says, repent. The people of Nineveh didn't just say sorry for what they had done, because repentance is more than that. It's more than just saying, forgive me, Lord, I'm sorry, I know what I did, and I'm I'm asking uh, you to forgive me for that. But repentance is is different. True repentance is about change. Yes, the start of repentance is acknowledging that we've sinned, asking for forgiveness for those sins. But then the next step is to change our behaviors so we don't find ourselves praying the same prayer over and over again about the same thing because we just refuse to change and refuse to stop doing it. Even the king of Nineveh, a pagan king, knew that it wasn't enough just to ask for forgiveness. He knew they had to change their ways because he says, let us give up or let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Not just saying sorry and doing it anyway. Repentance is turning. Just as Jonah turned away from his poor navigation, going west instead of east, just as the people turned from their violence and evil to a more humble life, honoring God, and just as Saul of Tarsus turned away from the persecution of the early church and became a great leader in the faith, and just as David turned away from his sinful relationship with Bathsheba and began again to honor the Lord. And in Psalm 51, there is steps of repentance that David gave us. And I'm going to skip through a lot of them. It's not all of the whole uh, psalm, <clears throat> but there's parts of it. It says, have mercy on me, O Lord, uh, according to your unfailing love. Wash away my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions. Against you and only you I've sinned. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. 
Create in me a pure heart, O God, a renew and steadfast spirit within me. This is the change. This is the turn. Create in me a pure heart going forward, a different way of doing things. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit. Restore me to the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your way or that sinners will turn back to you. Open my lips, Lord. This is the sharing of the gospel. Open my lips and my mouth to declare your praise. He is seeking forgiveness, but more than that, he is seeking restoration and he is seeking change. Imagine if a husband and wife are in a car together. The wife tells the husband to turn right, and he accidentally turns left. It's like, the other right. He realizes what he's done. And he says to his wife, I'm sorry, love, I went the wrong way. But if that's all he does, that's not enough. He's saying sorry, but it doesn't get them any closer to their destination. It doesn't stop them from going any further away than the direction they're supposed to be going in. So what they needed to do was stop the car, turn it around, and get back on the correct road that his wife originally told him to go on in the first place. That is repentance. <laughs> Let me wrap this up. <laughs> there are three important parts uh, of Jonah, of this particular section of Jonah, and they all tie together. The first is that God will give us second chances. He knows that we will fail. He knows our nature, our human nature of sin. The second is the fact that the pagan people of Nineveh changed their lives completely when they heard the word of God directly from the prophet Jonah. It may only have been eight words, or at least eight words that we know that were recorded in Scripture. In fact, in Hebrew, it's only five words. But these changed a nation. They drove them to repent. And the third part was the fact that when we do approach the Lord with humility and knowledge that we are sinners and that we need him, then we can repent and he will relent. Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray with me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. So God tells us, he shows us through his story and others that he will relent. And so if any of you here are thinking that there's no way God will take you back after a life of sinning, a life of running away in the other direction, that there's, you, you couldn't be further away from God than right now, then there's no truth in that. God never left. We distance ourselves from him. He wants us to repent and he wants us to come back to him. No matter what kind of life we've lived, no matter what we've done, he will take us back. Like the prodigal son who finds himself in the pigsty, in the pig slop. Or Jonah who gets spat up onto the beach uh, by, from the belly of a, a fish. Nothing is too far from God. And he will welcome and celebrate the return of his children. All we have to do is repent. Our sin, or our scale of sin, doesn't change God's power. And if anyone here is repeating the same prayer over and over, day after day, week after week, asking forgiveness for the same thing that keep on doing over and over again, then repent. Because repenting is change. It's transformation. It's turning back towards God. Sometimes it's a full 180 degrees in the other direction. And when we do repent, when we do begin to rebuild our lives on a new foundation of faith, it's then that we can bask in the forgiveness of a loving God. And then we can help others. The word of God is too good to keep to ourselves. It's too powerful to keep to ourselves. We don't want to watch our loved ones, our families and our friends, or even our neighbors or people across the world perish without the opportunity to allow themselves to be changed by his word. And so we are called to go out into the world to preach the good news, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or whether it's to our neighbor, whether it's across the world to people that we've never met before, but we are to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are called to be unleashed into our communities and make a difference in the lives of others, just as the Lord God made a difference in our own lives. In Nineveh, we read about this huge revival. It's estimated that at that time, 120,000 people were living in Nineveh. And with those same steps of revival, we can see change. We can see change in our own culture, even if we think we're getting to the point where it's unchangeable. Because our sin, or our scale of sin, doesn't change God's power. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the words that you have provided for us. The example of Jonah, the example of the people of Nineveh, 
and the example that you yourself provide. This idea that, yes, we run from you. Yes, we are sinners. We know this. You know this. That's why you give us these second chances. So Lord, help us to see these chances as they come along. To have the wisdom to take advantage of these chances, to change things that we do, to repent and a and 180 degree turn on what we're doing so that we're not repeating this request for forgiveness day after day and month after month. So we're grateful you give us this refreshing chance, this opportunity every morning to wake up and know that you will give us the opportunity that we need. It's up to us to take advantage of it. So Lord, give us the discernment and wisdom to do that. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in Jonah 4 today. Um, finishing up this series on Jonah. <clears throat> you know, eight years ago, or almost eight years ago, in May of 2016, there was a, a, an Israeli man who petitioned for a restraining order against God. Apparently, the plaintiff, who was identified as uh, David Shoshin, represented himself at the court hearing in Haifa, probably had trouble finding an attorney to represent him. Uh, and Haifa is kind of the port city in the northern part of Israel. And the report noted that God was not present to defend himself. Of course, God was present, but uh, obviously chose it was not worth defending himself in this case. Mr. Shoshan told the court that God had been treating him harshly and not nicely. Although there were no specific details of what exactly had happened to make this come about, Mr. Shoshin also explained that he had made several attempts to contact the police and, and file reports against these alleged crimes, and patrol cars had come to his house on 10 different occasions over a 36-month period. Police finally advised Shoshan that perhaps he should try taking out a restraining order. I'm sure they were joking, but... He did just that. The request for a restraining order was, de was denied by the presiding judge, who was Ashen Kanan. Uh, he called the case absurd, and the petitioner should require help from sources outside of the court. A little closer to home, there's a story of Jack Welch, who was the former CEO, uh, the, you know, the corporate chief of General Electric. He grew up as an Irish Catholic. He was an altar boy, he was, uh, and later as an adult, he was known to travel more than an hour to get to Mass on a Sunday morning. His commitment to faith, however, changed uh, years ago when his mother died of a heart attack. In his book, Jack Straight from the Gut, he writes, I felt cheated, angry, and mad at God for taking my mother away. Up until his death in 2020, he, was still, he still claimed to believe in God. He still uh, had a heart for God, but he did not have a heart for religious activity anymore, and he no longer attended church. So there's two stories of people that are angry at God. And so we come to the last chapter of Jonah, chapter 4. And in the previous parts of Jonah's story, we have noticed several surprising things. First of all, it seems astonishing that a prophet who knew the living God, that knew the true God, would attempt to hide from his presence. Second, it seems extraordinary that God would pursue Jonah. And he used the fear of, that, he, that Jonah had during a, a very bad storm. He also used uh, pagan sailors to help bring Jonah back to his senses, to wake him up, to wake his conscience up. And third, it's amazing that God would save Jonah from drowning and bring him to repentance in the, in the belly of a fish over three days and three nights, and that he gives Jonah a second chance. And then fourth, it's encouraging that the, preacher, the preaching that Jonah did in Nineveh brought an entire city from the king on down to its knees asking for repentance. And even more than that, as a result of it, God himself relented and changed his whole plan to destroy that city. But the most astonishing element in this story can be found in the, in the chapter that we're going to do today, chapter 4, because it's amazing that God's prophet could be angry to the point of wanting to die because he was so successful. Seems interesting. I have a sneaking suspicion, though, that this final chapter is probably where we can connect the most with Jonah out of the whole story. Since we've been reading the entire chapter for the other three, let's start out by reading through Jonah 4 and see where this takes us this morning. Jonah 4 goes like this. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. 
and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, this isn't what I said, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was at home? That, if, uh, that is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, it is, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah had gone out and sat down on a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. And when the Lord God provided a leafy plant, he made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so it withered. Then the sun rose. God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about this plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did nothing to tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should, should, I, have, should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? So we can, be, uh, we can get the impression very easily from the whole story of Jonah, as it's been told, chapter 1 through chapter 4, uh, that this is more about God's graciousness towards Jonah than it is perhaps to God's graciousness uh, uh, to Nineveh. Jonah is back on track, and yet God is still pursuing him. And it's more than likely because God can see his heart. He understands how deep this problem goes. He always understands how deep these problems go. But first of all, let's take a look at Jonah's anger. The first kind of four verses of this chapter. It starts off by saying, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. And the word this in this is referring back to what was said at the end of chapter 3, the very final part. It says that God did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. He didn't destroy the city. And consequently, God's mercy made Jonah angry. It's like when we were younger, we look at, uh, or at least it used to be this case, I can't speak for younger people now, but anyway, it used to be the case of when you're younger, you look at people that are in professional type roles, whether it's a teacher or other professions, or maybe even a preacher, and you look at them and say, they've got it all together. They know what they're saying. They understand everything. They got it all figured out in life. And as we read through the minor prophets, you would think that uh, as we read through them, that we would understand that they've got it all figured out. God speaks to them, and they speak to the people, so you'd assume that they, they know everything they need to know. They've got it all worked out. But as we see, and as we see as we get older, we realize that that's not actually true, <laughs> that all these people, these different professions that you think have it all figured out, don't have it figured out at all. In fact, we're going, all going through the same process. And we're reminded daily that there is still so much to learn. And Jonah, as a minor prophet, had so much to learn about God. You'd think he would know, but he had a lot to learn. But to give him credit, in, in verses 2 and 3, he does actually pray to God. He was angry with God, but he decides to pray to God. Because it's easy when you're angry with God just to disassociate yourself, decide to walk away, have nothing to do with it, even blaspheme uh, about God to other people. But not in this case. He chose to pray. And it's in this prayer that the, the first time in this book we understand why he decided to run to Tarshish in the first place. Because he's saying, I knew you were going to do this. I know that you're a loving and a giving and a forgiving God, so I had a feeling that you were going to forgive him, so I didn't want anything to do with that in the first place. So that's why he ran. He knew God was gracious. He knew God was compassionate. And so Jonah had originally feared it happened, had actually happened, and he was watching it play out, and God was, in fact, sparing Nineveh. But then he goes on to say, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. And from this, we can be sure that Jonah's anger is really running deep at this point. There, these are the words of a desperate person. These are the words of somebody who's very emotionally distraught. How could someone who was so thankful for life, not far ago as we were going through this story, now be so dismissive about his own life? Let's take another look at, uh, on, at 
comparison here for the purposes of seeing what Jonah's problem really was. Because there's another prophet who said very similar things to God, and that was Elijah. Elijah had just come off this amazing display of God's power. He'd been up on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. He'd challenged them to this... I don't know what you'd call it, but it was like you just uh, fire off, I guess. It's like if you want to call it that. But there's about uh, the, they built the altars. They put all the offerings on the altar. The, the prophets of Baal have been praying and praying to Baal to bring fire down to start the fire so that they could have the offering, but never happened. And when they were exhausted, Elijah took over and he doused it with water over and over again to the point where it would have been impossible to light and God brings down fire from heaven. And it's this amazing demonstration of the power and sovereignty of God. So he comes off that, and um, and then he hears that Jezebel was on this rampage, and she was out to get him. And in 1 Kings 19.4, he says, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. So what's the difference between Jonah's death wish and Elijah's death wish? Because God pursued Elijah as well. He comes to him and asks him twice, what are you doing here, Elijah? That's in verses 9 and 13. And Elijah answers that question twice, the same answer. In 1 Kings 19.10, he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. So Elijah wasn't despondent because of the grace of God. He was upset and giving up because of the sin of people. Elijah was upset because God's purpose was not being accomplished. Jonah was angry because it was. Elijah was thinking about the people and about God's cause. Jonah was just thinking about himself. God fed Elijah. He encouraged him by telling him he was not alone, and then he put him back to work. But God had another, another plan for Jonah. He had an object lesson for Jonah. He didn't take the life of either of those prophets because it was just not the right time. It was better off that they were alive than dead. But in verse 4, God asks a very important question to Jonah. God says, is it right for you to be angry? God's question is a call really for Jonah to reevaluate his moral position in this. Is he right or is the anger wrong? Is anger as a whole wrong? In Ephesians 4.26, it says, in your anger, do not sin. It does not say, do not be angry. It just says, when you are angry, do not sin in the process. But the implication of God's question to him here is that Jonah is in the wrong, that the anger he has is the wrong motivation. It was more of a rhetorical question. He wasn't really asking for Jonah to answer this question. It was more of a rhetorical question. But what happens next is God's way of pointing all of this out to him, that his anger was misjudged. It's God's way of saying, you need to really think about what you're feeling. You need to think about this. In order to look at this question, we have to really think about why Jonah was angry in the first place. What was Jonah's motivation for being so angry? Because it's almost like this burning anger. So angry he wanted to die. And this question has really been put out there. There's a handful of answers out there, and commentators all over have different opinions about what it is that is driving um, Jonah's anger in the first place. But the first possibility is that he is such a patriot. His patriotism, his nationalistic spirit has taken over. He was a true patriot to the the nation of Israel, uh, and he had a true passion for it. That meant, in his mind, any compassion against the enemies of Israel was just wrong. He thought that God's purposes were all contingent upon military defeat or God destroying them. And even now, in this day and age, there are many people, Christians, patriotic Americans, who think that it's the will of God that they hate the enemies of America. The only way to be patriotic is to hate those that are considered to be the enemy. But God loves every person, every nation, and every culture. It doesn't mean that he approves of their conduct. It does not mean that he approves of other religious activity or worshiping of idols. And of course, the most important thing to God is that they repent and they come into obedience of his will. But they have to have the ability to repent. They have to have the option to change just as we do and just as the uh, the Assyrian nation did through Nineveh. And yet Jonah cannot understand why God would show grace with people like that. Or perhaps his anger was so deep-seated that it came from um, 
hatred and racism of the people of Assyria. I mean, that could have been the case. The Assyrians were considered villains at the time in that culture. People hated them. There was long-standing and generational prejudice that came against the Assyrian people. And that could be a cruel master in our lives. It's very difficult to shake this generational prejudice against people it's just because your parents did, your grandparents did, and so it just becomes something that we do. Not, not because we're bad people necessarily. It can still happen in the minds of good people. But it's difficult to break loose from its grip. And it's always challenging to be like God. It's challenging to have this unconditional love that God has. Not endorsing the sin, but certainly offering the same opportunities for repentance, the same opportunities for forgiveness across the board, no matter who these people are. Or maybe his anger was just about selfishness. This third explanation for his anger certainly could make a lot of sense. This revival or this complete change of heart in Nineveh could be personal ruin for him. He's the prophet that went off to Nineveh to take care of business. God was going to bring down and rain down fire on Nineveh and get rid of Israel's enemy. A prophet in Israel would find it very difficult to go back into Israel triumphantly if God just forgave Nineveh and nothing happened to their enemies. Jonah wasn't alone in how he felt about the people of Nineveh. It would have been a sense of a feeling across the nation of Israel that would be looking for God to avenge them through destroying their enemies. So, think about Saul of Tarsus. Saul was heralded amongst his people as a leader until he started converting Gentiles, and then he became just as hated as they were. Jonah may have been thinking about how it would impact him, so it could have been selfish anger. Or perhaps his anger could have been because he was just not very generous with God's grace. He was very thankful when God offered grace to him, but he was, got angry when it was given to others that he felt were not deserving of his grace. Biblically speaking, this is not a, a very unique attitude across uh, the scripture as we read it. The elder brother of the prodigal son also had a similar problem. He wasn't excited to see all the hoopla when his brother came back after his journey he wasn't excited to see how quickly and how like, thoroughly his father forgave him. The Pharisees, as they were watching Jesus eat with uh, tax collectors and sinners, they couldn't understand how he could associate with the people that were considered to be the enemy in that culture, the tax collectors and the sinners. And the workers who slaved all day in the fields and then watched as people came later in the day, but they still got paid the same amount as they did at the end of the day. But we have to remember that God has absolute sovereignty over his own mercy. We don't get to decide who God gives mercy to. We cannot be prejudiced against people that we don't feel are deserving. In Romans 9.15, Paul writes, or he quotes, I will have have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Further on in this passage, we see Jonah further outside the city. He sets up his little camp in a shady area, is waiting to see if God will change his mind. He's still hoping that God will change his mind. And while he's waiting, God provides for him a leafy plant to to shade his head. It grew up quickly. If you thought the beanstalk in Jack and the Beanstalk grew quickly, well, this grew up very quickly to the height where it could shade his head. Again, this is God providing grace for him. Once again, as we can see, it it was designed to ease his discomfort, as it says in verse 6. Absolutely, he knew what would make this materialistic and very selfish man very happy. And it worked, because Jonah's response was he was very happy about the plant, but he was still angry about the circumstances. He was happy about the shade, but he watched for God still to destroy the city. He was hoping God would still change his mind again. His heart hadn't changed. And if we think about that for a second, it's, you know, God knew exactly what would make this materialistic and selfish person happy. It would give him some shade that would briefly give him happiness, but it certainly didn't change his heart. And we do the same thing for ourselves right now. We look for little things that will make us happy. Jonah sat in his misery. He was briefly made happy by this plant shade, but his mood was still dark. And we try to fill life, our lives with things that will make us happy, and they do. Frequently, they make us happy, but often our our mood remains dark. But the reality is that there's only one thing that will lighten our overall mood, and that is a trust in Jesus Christ for salvation. That is what, in the long haul, will provide for us the mood lifting, the joy that we need in our lives, because there is salvation through him. We're saved, 
Even if in the short term we have some discomfort, we are saved in the long term. And these idols in our lives that, rep- that we replace God with become like this leafy plant, very pleasant for a little while. They make us happy for a little while, but it's fleeting. And as we see in verse 7 and 8, we find out the next morning God sends a worm to attack the plant and it withers. No more shade for Jonah. And even further than that, he sends this scorching east wind and he sends uh, that combined with the hot sun, beats down on Jonah, who was left now unprotected, and he wanted to die. If you were here last week, you remember I said that Nineveh, the modern city that was Nineveh then, is now Mosul in Iraq. And the desert there can reach up to 125 degrees. Jonah's happiness then swings back in the other direction, and he wishes he was dead. He's now in this renewed state of misery, and God then decides to speak to Jonah again. And at this point, he has... He has something he really wants to say to Jonah. He says, is it right for you to be angry about this plant? It is, he said. And I'm so angry, I wish I was dead. But the Lord said, you have have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight, and it died overnight. So the question that was asked now is being repeated by God. So God asked that question before, is it right for you to be angry? But now he's putting it in a slightly different context. He's saying, is it right for you to be angry about this plant? Jonah's reply was quick. I don't think he saw this as a rhetorical question like the other one. He was like, it is. It's perfectly justified. And then he restates the fact that he thinks he'd be better off dead. But here we see Jonah's unreasonableness really come out. Jonah had no right to complain about the withered plant. He did nothing to produce it in the first place. We certainly, as people, grieve over our plants. God provides us with some great things in life, often We have nothing to do with the production of these things. And the fact that we have them have nothing to do with our own uh, intervention, our own ingenuity. They just appear and God blesses us in that way. We tend to claim these things then as our right. And then we complain when they get taken away. There might be this unspoken assumption that we deserve God's blessings. And like Jonah, we consequently reserve the right to complain when they're gone. But we should always keep in mind the graciousness of God. We should celebrate his grace on a regular basis. We should be much slower to complain when our plant withers. In the story of Job, Job asks the rhetorical question, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? But Jonah had a concern and a pity for this measly plant. But he had no pity for a whole city of lost people, 120,000 lost people, and Jonah's anger is exposed because of a plant. It's a lack of compassion. He's exposed as hypocritical, as shallow, and as ultimately not compassionate at all. And his final comment about the fact that he would rather die is just a little bit overdramatic. Another minor prophet, Habakkuk, he declared that no matter what happened, he would choose to live by faith. He's a great example. Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18 says, Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I'll be joyful in God my Savior. Habakkuk is describing a devastating crop failure, a lack of food, no cattle, no sheep, no nothing. And Jonah's upset about the mere lack of shade. So based on this story, how does our compassion stack up to God's? Can we really begin to understand the heart of God when it comes to his pursuit of sinners? Jonah's reaction and mourning of this plant is a hint. And in turn, we should be considering what we truly mourn and what if we were to lose it. Is it justified? Is our mourning a reasonable thing to mourn? Because God mourns for the sinners more, the lost people more than what we could possibly mourn for. If we can begin to relate to God's feelings, if we can begin to see what God is saying to Jonah, then if we lose our home, if we lose our air conditioning or our wealth or our possessions, or if we lose our comforts, we tend to have pity for ourselves, but we don't have pity for people that never had access to those things in the first place. We never feel pity for people who have never heard the hope of Jesus Christ. They don't have the future that we have. We never feel pity for people who have given up on God because, we feel, because they feel like their sin just runs too deep and they can never come back. But Jonah was more concerned about his own comfort and how he will look to his own people 
and how unfair it seems that he that they can have and be given what he has already been given and that is forgiveness he's sometimes referred to as the sulking servant we should also be considering the impact that the story should have on us when we look at this story it's about grace and compassion not just for the people of Nineveh but certainly for Jonah and as followers of Christ, it's, it's our call in our life to mirror the examples that we see in Scripture. Not so much the example of Jonah, but the example that God is trying to impress upon Jonah. So we should be trying to mirror those sorts of, uh, those sorts of things. And so, out of that, we can mirror compassion towards the people that are not like us. We should give more latitude to others. True compassion provides time to the lost so that we can give an opportunity for them to hear God's truth and come to repentance. Jonah should have been in the city with all of those sinners rather than sitting outside waiting for God to change his mind and burn up the city. He was under a shady plant. He was happy for a brief moment. We can't be stingy with God's grace. God's words are for everyone. Uh, and to, we need to be the tools to take it to them. God's compassion should always be on display with his people. Jesus told this parable, a parable in order to reinforce that. In Matthew 18, we read a parable that definitely outlines exactly how we should act as Christians when it comes to compassion and forgiveness. In Matthew 18, 21, it starts off just by saying, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I'll tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. In some versions, it says 70 times seven. And before we get to the parable, Jesus didn't literally mean 77 times. And then on the 78th time, you're like counting and go, you're out of luck now. Not forgiven you this time. He just meant a really high number. A much higher number than you should possibly need for any one occasion to give, forgive anybody. But the parable goes like this. It says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. And since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children uh, and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. But this, at this, the servant fell on his knees and begged him. He said, be patient with me and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found a fellow servant who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. But his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. He said, be patient with me. Uh, I will pay it back. But he refused. And instead he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged. They went and told the master everything that had happened. The master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all of the debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Jonah had been forgiven. But he chose not to accept the forgiveness of the people that he had gone and spoken to. Jonah had been forgiven for his intentional disobedience. But now he couldn't handle God forgiving ignorant disobedience. Because it was ignorant disobedience. The people of Ninevite were not followers of God. But they turned around because they became followers of God. The Ninevites might have been undeserving of mercy, but no more than Jonah. It's called, the reason it's called mercy is because we don't deserve it. Jesus said, don't try to pluck out the speck out of others' eyes when you have a plank in your own eye. The Ninevites may well have had a two-by-four in their eye, but Jonah was judging them when he had a two-by-six in his own eye. Jesus tells us in the Sermon of the Mount that the standard we use for judging others will be used to judge us. And we will be treated as we treat others. C.S. Lewis said in The Great Divorce, not accepting God's forgiveness for others can also keep us out of his grace. Jonah doesn't fully understand or he doesn't fully embrace God's heart. And who is it for you? Who are our Ninevites? Who is it that even if they came to Christ, even if they had a change of mindset that we would still think, well, that's nice, but they don't deserve that chance. Do I want them to sit in a pew with me? Do I want them to take my parking spot in the parking lot? 
Do I want them to send my, their children to Sunday school with my children? But there are millions of people around the world who every day are facing starvation. They're facing death from disease or war or disaster. There are millions of people who are facing an eternity without ever hearing about Christ. And there are thousands in our own city who don't know the moral right hand from the left. And God comes to us and says, should I not be concerned about this great city? There may be days when we are deeply concerned and complaining about our own comfort level to God. But God comes to us and says, you know, you know what is concerning me? And then we listen to him and we come back and we say, on second thoughts, maybe our life is not so bad. It's not that we shouldn't bring our small concerns to God. Every small prayer, every large prayer is very relevant and should be brought to God. But sooner or later, we must ask God, what is his concern in the world? What should we be concerned about because he is concerned about it? And as Jonah draws to a conclusion in 4.11, he says, And should I not have concern for this great city of Nineveh, in which there were more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is how the book ends. It ends with a question mark. Jonah had no answer because God's logic is absolute. But maybe it ends this way because this this is a question that should be asked again and again in every generation across the ages. Writer John R. Domolo writes, there is no finer close in literature than this ending. The divine question, should not I have pity? remains unanswered. Its echoes are heard still above every crowded haunt of men, above the stir and din and wickedness of the infinite compassion is still brooding. A question that goes on and on into the ages. The ending may seem a bit abrupt. It may seem unresolved. We might like to know how Jonah had responded, but it's not really important that we know what he did or what he said at that point. Jonah's missing final answer isn't an oversight. It's not a result of us lacking the last page of the manuscript. Jonah is not the main character here. God is. And we're left with this intentional, powerful statement about God's grace. Rather than show us Jonah's response, God invites us to respond. It's an open question to us. We will show compassion or we'll run away from our responsibility. As Christians, we are compelled to care. God didn't hang up on Jonah. Do we hang up on God when he doesn't fulfill our own expectations? Jonah is an interesting, and on the surface, uh, quite a fantastical story as part of Scripture, but it has some very serious and deep underlying subjects for us to really chew on as believers in Christ. And as Christians, we should pull some of these applications from its chapters. It's a rich environment to do just that. It could be that we pull from it that uh, the fact that we cannot run, that we cannot hide, that God is there all the time, that spiritually we may be absent, but physically we can never distance ourselves or put distance between us and God. Or it could be that we pull out of this that uh, the fact that God never wastes an opportunity in a moment, that even though Jonah was thrown overboard in the middle of a big storm, God showed those pagan sailors his power and his sovereignty over nature, and they worshipped him. Or perhaps we can pull out of it that God redirects us sometimes in unusual ways, and usually it's, it's not always in great comfort. Being in the belly of a fish for three days is not a very comfortable way to be redirected, but it worked, and it got his attention. Or it could be that we can pull out of this that sometimes just a short message, if it is the word of God, can make a huge difference. It can be life-changing, sometimes on a large scale. Because it's God's word that's so powerful, we are just merely a vessel to, to deliver it. Or maybe it's the fact that even when we don't agree with God, we should still pray. We can be angry with God, but we should still pray. Because when we pray, we often find a change of heart. When we pray, we often find a change of perspective. Uh, And it's how we pray that's important. Let me close with this story about three ministers who were talking about the way that we should pray, the right position that we should pray in when we pray to God. As they were talking, there was a telephone repairman working in the background on the phone system. And one minister said that he felt that the key to praying was the hands. He said he always put his hands together, pointed them upward, upward in a form of sort of symbolic worship. The second suggested that real prayer could only be done when you're on your knees, 
And then the third minister suggested that they were both wrong and that the only position that could possibly be used to pray to God that was worth its salt in any way was to lay on the floor face down and pray to God that way. By, the time, by this time, the phone man just couldn't contain himself anymore. He needed to interject what he thought about prayer. And so he said, I found the most powerful prayer I ever made was when I was dangling upside down from my heels from a power pole 40 feet above the ground. And I think that the most powerful prayer that Jonah ever prayed was in the belly of a fish. When he found himself in a circumstance where he felt he really needed to change it quickly. And so we have to think about how we pray for the Ninevites in our lives. Pray a powerful prayer. Not just for the forgiveness for others, but that we will have a heart of forgiveness ourselves. Because salvation comes from the Lord. He loves and so should we. He is there for us just as we should be there for other people, even if we don't feel like they're the right people for us. And he forgives, and so should we. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the story of Jonah. We're thankful for your mercy, your compassion on not just us, but others. People that perhaps we might look down on and we feel don't deserve it, but you always find compassion for them. Open our eyes, Lord, to see the people in front of us that perhaps we don't connect with instantly, perhaps we don't feel a connection to at all. But Lord, help us to see that they deserve compassion and mercy just as much as we do. But Lord, we don't deserve it at all in the end of the day, but you give it anyway. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Lord, help us to have wisdom and discernment in all that we do. Help us to see that we should treat people the way you treat us. Because ultimately we'll be judged that way. So we'll open our eyes to see the people in our lives, these Ninevites, that we perhaps have prejudice against, that we need to, to change, have a different perspective, to turn around and just offer our peace and offer your peace so that they can have the salvation that you provide. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. We invite you to join us in person next week at any of our services, 8, 9.30 or 11, or join us online again at 9.30. New Hope is a church for the entire family. We have ministries for all ages. During our 9.30 and 11 o'clock services, our children's ministry welcomes all kids, infants through sixth grade, and our student ministry has its own engaging service at 11 o'clock specifically for your junior high and high school students. We'd love to get to know your entire family. You can find out more about New Hope and all the different events and classes that go on throughout the week on our website or on social media. If you have any questions about New Hope or would like to take the next step in your faith, reach out to us by phone or email or stop by the church office. Thank you again for being with us and hope to see you soon.